Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome back. Welcome at the second day on this workshop on financial accounts. Also, very welcome to those of you who join us online. Uh, well, today we have the second day of our workshop, and that will be devoted to, well, data sources and organization. Uh, like yesterday, I hope we will have a lively discussion with lots of questions. So we certainly designed the course to trigger that, but also please use the opportunity to ask all the questions you uh, want. Uh, for this morning, we'll kick off with Tico Mira, who will present the results of the uh, country survey which has been sent out to you and which you reply to. So she will give a short summary, Tico Mira. Good morning. While waiting for the presentation, just to say it's, um, we sent you a short uh, survey. Uh, as I said, we didn't know anything. It's the first time we organize uh, uh, event on financial accounts. So we didn't know much about what you do, where you stand with financial accounts. So that was the main purpose of this survey, just to orient uh, ourselves where you are in the compilation. And also, where should I point the clicker? And also we wanted that uh, we know which issues are of main concern for you so we can shape the agenda of this uh, workshop. So in no way this is some in-depth um, overview of um, what you are doing or insights of uh, the methodological issues. It just uh, the purpose is to inform you who does what in that room. So maybe you already discovered in the coffee breaks. We've received uh, replies from 14 countries, from Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan. We have received two responses, one from the central bank, one from the statistical office, and we've merged them together to best of our understanding. Apologies if we misinterpreted some of your answers. So from this set of 14 countries, about half are producing in, uh, financial accounts by institutional sector. The financial accounts are already in place and they're regularly produced in Kazakhstan, North Macedonia, Turkey, and Ukraine. And experimental estimates have been implemented in Armenia, Kosovo, and Moldova. Moldova is still at early stages and Kosovo is producing uh, for two institutional sectors only at that stage. All of the countries that produce both experimental and regularly financial accounts do compile uh, financial flows. Uh, all except uh, Ukraine uh, compile financial balance sheets and only Armenia, Kazakhstan and Turkey compile other <coughs> changes in assets account. Uh, responsibility also is split somehow in the countries. Uh, Central Bank is the main uh, institution uh, uh, responsible for the compilation and dissemination of uh, financial accounts in Moldova, no North Macedonia, Kosovo and Turkey. And the National Statistical Office takes a lead role in that in the other three countries. Uh, there are also other institutions involved in the compilation process. In all of the countries, the Ministry of Finance is uh, part of the process. And this uh, depends uh, mainly on the setup of the countries. Uh, quite often, uh, different uh, supervisory institutions for the financial cooperation sector for certain parts of the financial cooperation sector were uh, mentioned. Uh, like uh, regulators of the insurance company, etc. Also the securities, <coughs> registries, depository and the stock exchanges. In quite few countries, so I think only one or two tax uh, data was used and also in Kazakhstan social and health insurance funds data. However, nobody have provided uh, any details on the institutional arrangements. And on the other hand, the countries that don't have yet uh, financial accounts were interested in the arrangements, memorandums of understanding of those who already have. So maybe this is something we could consider as an outcome of the workshop. We've already posted online the memorandum of understanding that is um, in Netherlands. If you have any documents like that in English or in Russian that other countries can use, uh, you could send to us links and we could post them. So we create some on the workshop website, some kind of reference 
site for others who are still in early stages. Uh, the data sources, I think these are the standard data sources. Uh, Manuel will go later through, through those. I won't go into details or spend time on that. Uh, the main challenges <clears throat> which were linked with the availability of data sources, a, a typical problem is the lack of uh, direct data sources for the household sector. And of course, there are gaps in many of the countries for the non-financial cooperation sector when it comes to those positions that are not covered by the banking uh, statistics. As uh, John already talked yesterday, the um, assets and liabilities within the non-financial corporations uh, lacking uh, information. And even more so, that is obvious on quarterly uh, data well, for the countries who compile quarterly balance sheet, uh, the uh, intercompany loans and trade credits are the, the weak point. Then uh, several countries said that they have limited uh, uh, data sources, direct data sources on the financial flows. And then the <clears throat> flows uh, have to be derived from balance sheets, but then in the lack of uh, suitable data on revaluation or other changes in the volume assets account, uh, this, this is not uh, easy. Uh, about uh, challenges with valuation and recording of different financial instruments, most often the market valuation was um, a problem for listed shares because obviously in many countries there is underdeveloped capital market. Uh, there were also issues with valuation of debt securities. As far as I understood, this is more linked to issues with the access to <clears throat> uh, data, data sources and the databases on securities, and the common problem of unlisted equity, how to value unlisted equity. Uh, then in two country governments, the finance statistics was mainly in cash basis, and that was posing questions for valuation, and again, estimation of trade credits and intercompany loans for non-financial corporations on a quarterly basis. Uh, the other issue was, uh, that was mentioned was about the correct allocation of certain financial instruments. Uh, for example, would it be time deposit or other deposits? Uh, how consistency of the accounts, uh, of financial and non-financial accounts is ensured uh, among the good practices that were mentioned is uh, the main the main thing you can do is this is the cooperation. This is the main prerequisite for ensuring good quality and consistent accounts. Uh, the importance of the central bank and the NSO and the good relations uh, between them was uh, mentioned in almost all replies of the countries who responded, of the seven countries who compile accounts. Then um, things that were mentioned were also things that came from the discussion yesterday, clear distribution of responsibility, the data collection, John Savarys. Uh, like good practice, what was mentioned was also the development of um, a register or list of inst units by institutional sector. So the same list of units is applied across the different data sources and statistics that are compiled by the bank and the statistical office. And uh, of course, all this uh, should be uh, supported by formal working groups and formal arrangements uh, with specifying the responsibilities of all involved institutions. Other way of ensuring consistency was uh, looking at counterpart information of counterpart sectors for the respective uh, instrument. And then also what was highlighted, you need clear instructions to the respondents who fill in the surveys and legal frameworks that support the data collection. Uh, Turkey, uh, we will hear later from Turkey. They just express interest to uh, present their successful experience. And it's also based on this prerequisite we talked before. The countries that don't compile uh, financial sector the financial accounts by institutional sector yet, uh, as well seven, but I should say that uh, many of them do compile the, the financial part of the balance of payments for the rest of the world account. All these seven countries have intention to start the compilation of financial accounts in the future. 
And in five of them, this has already been foreseen in the national strategies for statistics development or any annual uh, work plans. Uh, in Turkmenistan, this process is also being formalized. Uh, based on the plans countries have uh, in uh, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kyrgyzstan and Montenegro, the plans are that the central bank will be the main responsible institution and in the other four countries, it is expected that this is shared responsibility between the bank and the statistical office. The main factors that have impeded the compilation of financial accounts up to now, it's... Uh, usually what we meet with any production of statistics, but maybe here they even sharpen stronger, the human resources, the retaining of trained staff, uh, the, their access to data sources, different gaps and inconsistency, or data sources not in the right format. Um, again, that was mentioned as a good prerequisite for compilation of financial accounts, but here it's uh, one of the reasons why that is not possible is the um, absence of a list of institutional units by sectors that is applied by different institutions and uh, there was need of some expert support to develop the overall methodology for the collection of, uh, of data and for the compilation of financial accounts. So the topics that uh, you wanted to discuss here, and as you see, our agenda is much uh, structured around those topics. We will speak today about the data sources and data gaps and uh, how to deal with that and about the organization of the compilation process. So ask your questions to the experts, but also between you. And uh, tomorrow we'll speak about uh, methods to ensure consistency in practice for the accounts. There were some more concrete questions that were raised by you. Uh, we will have, um, we've left an, about an hour and a half, I think in the end of the day tomorrow about more open session on questions and answers on any topics that you may wish to cover outside these uh, three big groups of questions. We have also opened the link so use it, uh, Stella, if you could post it in the chat, use it to put your questions there if they're more detailed. It's just for us to get organized and to see how much time we need and uh, also who from here, the other experts could uh, take up your question and look into more in detail. So send us your questions. Uh, the link will be posted into the chat. I hope also online participants could uh, follow and participate in that. Uh, we didn't hear much from them yesterday. Hopefully, it will be more active today. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tihumira. Um, I think this item was for, for information. Uh, like you said, Tihumira, tomorrow there will be plenty of time and room for, for questions you might have. So without further ado, I'd like to move to uh, Emmanuel. Uh, and em Emmanuel will take us into the, uh, well, an overview of the main data sources uh, used for the compilation of financial accounts. And so, Emmanuel. So good morning, everyone. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed yesterday's uh, walk and uh, you had a nice uh, dinner at the restaurant. What I would like to do um, this morning with uh, this presentation here, I'm going to take I'll make the assumption that everyone is quite well aware of you know government finance statistics and balance of payments. So what I've done in my presentation, I've left those two aspects towards the end, and I would like just to talk about more about monetary financial statistics, non-financial corporations, and households. So what I would like is if you want you can, this time around, you can stop me you know, during my presentation, because I'm hoping that, you know, the last two, we don't necessarily have to go through them. And those you can go through at your own time, if that's okay. But if you're, if I get the feeling or the sense that you actually, you need to go through government finance statistics and balance the payments, I could do that as well. Okay. So in terms of uh, the outline, so we could, and maybe one thing I forgot to mention so when we want to talk about you know monetary and financial statistics and government finance statistics and the balance of payments they're from the perspective of those manuals 
Okay, so they're not from the perspective of the national counts, but they're but they're from the perspective of those manuals. And the reason why um, I took that approach is because again, um, I made the assumption that you're going to be takers of that information. Okay, so you're going to have to know how to make certain adjustments once you receive that data. All right. So the outline, I'll just basically go through the various data stores, sources, starting from MFS, non-financial corporations, households, and NIPISH, you know, government and public sector statistics, rest of the world, and like I said, time permitting will be, you know, the last three, and then we'll also have security databases. Okay. All right. So when we look at um, the data sources from the monetary and financial statistics, what, what we've done here is we have them into, uh, into basically three buckets, if you will. So the source data is usually, you know, micro data. You know, it's actual institutional units that report stock and flow data based on their accounting reports, okay? And the compilation and presentation is based on institutional units, financial reporting and accounting standards and practices. Now, when we look at, for example, the central bank, the central bank collects, you know, obviously information on itself. And in some countries, it also might collect information on behalf of, you know, the financial institutions that it regulates. Right? So it's one of the basically one source. And then, of course, we also have, you know, surveys for financial institutions. So when we look at the data, from the perspective of, of the monetary financial statistics, I guess we can basically, what they've done is they, they basically group them into three major categories, okay? So the, the first category is the central bank. You know, and here we're, we're making the assumption that information should be easily and readily available from the central bank, right? It's one institutional unit, you know, it's basically the primary, you know, financial institution in, in, in the economies. And, you know, it, and it, it collects the information on behalf of the other financial institutions that it reports. Okay. So the, self, the central bank is more or less self-contained. Then the second major bucket was the other depository corporations. Again, here, the reporting should, again, be accessible, you know, uh, to compilers and you know, the data should be, you know, very timely and very robust. Again, in most economies, the central bank has, you know, uh, legislation and regulation over the deposit taking uh, institutions. So the flow of information should be stra straightforward. Then the third bucket when it comes to monetary and financial statistics is what they call, for example, the other financial corporations. So, as you know, in this, in this system of national accounts, we have eight financial sectors. So you can see now this group here, other financial corporations, A is quite diverse, and it encompasses, you know, I would say much more difficult financial institutions than deposit taking institutions. Okay. And because of the diversity of other financial corporations, this causes, you know, um, some problems, you know, for compilers. One, it's not, true, not necessarily true that the central bank supervises, you know, these other financial corporations, okay? And in most economies, they might not be as large as deposit-taking corporations. However, th the growth in some of these is very, very dramatic, okay? And could cause systemic risks, you know, to the system if it's not properly, you know, uh, regulated or uh, covered in the statistics. This one, sorry, I forgot to change my slides. Okay, hmm, so we have a little bit of differences in what I have, that's okay. So, um, so I was saying before, when it comes to other depository corporations, it includes a host of uh, financial uh, institutions. So here, for example, you're gonna have to start thinking about how you're gonna try to get information from them. Now, most you know, inst institutional units in the economy are more or less, you know, I would say there's some kind of regulation governing them. So it's not necessarily means that these are basically you know, informal, 
you know, institutional units or their, you know, uh, underground institutional units. The, the problem with them is that they're not going through the regulatory channel or the superintendent of financial institutions. However, if they're publicly traded, there is going to be some kind of information for them. So we take, for example, you know, um, investment funds. So when we look at investment funds, they're broken down between money market and non-money market investment funds. The problem or one of the challenges you have with investment funds is that A, there's a host of different types of investment funds that are actually operating in your economy and they rapidly evolve and change. Okay? So you can think about you know, the, what they're actually doing, they're collective investment schemes. So they pull funds you know, from shareholders and they you know, basically invest in, in securities and you know, uh, both financial and non-financial. However, you can get non-money market funds investing in anything you like, okay? So for example, when tobacco you know, became taboo, that's okay. You know, there's always going to be you know, a non-money market fund that somehow is going to invest in tobacco companies. So if you want to invest in tobacco companies, you can find an investment fund that's actually going to do or actually undertake that kind of investment. Now, the problem that you're going to have is how are you going to collect the data? So what happens is if you try the survey approach when it comes to collective investment schemes, it's going to be very, very difficult. One, there's not a diverse uh, you know, uh, uh, investment funds in, in the market to begin with. Secondly, they rapidly change. Okay. So they grow, there's a lot of mergers and acquisitions amongst themselves, you know, and they rapidly evolve. So if you think about a survey, you know, usually when you're trying to design, you know, a survey, you know, an efficient survey, you start thinking about, well, how am I going to stratify the survey? Because you want to be able to sample homogeneous units. So when it comes to collective investment schemes, you have a, a problem here because your, your, your stratification variables are going to be quite large and, you know, quite numerous as well. And they're going to be very costly to actually survey, uh, you know, these types of, of funds using a, a survey. So one approach, and, you know, it does, yes, cost some money, is to go to a third-party provider. So usually in a lot of economies, there's going to be, you know, a, a body, a third party that actually collects that information. Okay. So in North America, you have, for example, Morningstar is, you know, uh, basically a custodian or a provider of mutual fund data, okay? And what you could do is you can make arrangements with them to try to get the information. Now, what you want, though, is the underlying assets that the investment fund is actually investing, okay? You want the units, of course, because the units are basically going to be the shareholders, but what you really would like to know also is the underlying assets, because when we're trying to make sure that the debt securities and other securities match the assets and liabilities, you need to know what the collective investment schemes are actually investing in, okay? So one approach is to go to these third-party providers and try to see if you can make some kind of arrangement to obtain you know, uh, their information. Now, there's also, you know, in this, in this sphere, other types, you know, of uh, financial institutions that actually you know, lend funds, but they don't take deposits, okay? So you have a lot of what they call sales and business financing companies that are also part of, you know, the other financial corporations. Um, you're also going to have, you know, in, in the case of the monetary financial statistics, financial auxiliaries are going to be part of this, uh, et cetera. So all of these different, you know, financial institutions are going to need some kind of strategy for you to collect information. And because they're not going to be readily available from, you know, the, the superintendent of financial institutions or the regulatory body, you're going to have to think of strategies of how to get the information. Okay. Now, if, you know, you're endowed with a lot of funds, yes, you can conduct surveys, you know, however, you know, if you don't, then you're going to have to use other means to get the information. Now, one thing with these, especially when it comes to sales and business financing companies and other type of other financial intermediaries, because you know, they need access to capital, they should, you know, what it means, they need access from capital markets, they should be providing some kind of, you know, financial disclosure, 
which should be publicly available. So what happens in, in most economies is that when a institutional unit requires capital financing from the market, it usually has to provide some kind of prospectus either to you know, regulatory or to, uh, to a public, you know, or to a public source. So again, you can have access to that public source and get that information, okay? So again, in, in, in North America, there's a, you know, a website called CDAR. And what they do is they not only have you know, information on you know, uh, financial institutions, but all companies that require you know, um, access to funds from capital markets. Now, one of the drawbacks, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit later when it comes to financial statements, is that they might not provide all the granularity of information that you require. Okay, So what you're going to have to do then is you're going to have to figure out, well, okay, what can we get you know, from these public available sources? And then what is the data gap? And then you're going to try to work you know, maybe using a survey to try to you know, uh, bridge the, the data gap or you're gonna to have to try to find other sources um, to do so, okay? Is there any question on the, from the financial institution side? Okay. So now let's move to non-financial corporations. So we have a, you know, uh, uh, some, other, some other challenges when it comes to uh, non-financial corporations. And the, re the problem with, we have that with non-financial corporations is because they're co all come in different sizes. They come in different sizes and they actually conduct, you know, their activities, you know, in various industries. So it makes it again, because of this heterogeneity, it's very, very difficult to try to have one, one homogeneous type of vehicle to try to, you know, collect and compile information. On their behalf, you know there are uh, you know some primary data sources. So here we're saying that yes, you know you can try to you know establish an enterprise survey. Okay. Uh, there's also administrative data, such as you know taxation data. And here we're talking about corporate information, tax uh, information that could be available to you. Again, there's also going to be some publicly available corporate financial statements, as I just mentioned before. If the non-financial corporation needs, you know, uh, capital from capital markets, it has to provide some kind, you know, of a paper trail, you know, in order to get uh, that kind of financing. Of course, there's counterpart data, right, uh, that you can try to to look. And there's also, you know, depending on the the activity, there's also associations that you can look at. So, for example, you know, in when it comes in manufacturing you know, activities, there could be, you know, associations like the steel, you know, um, manufacturing association or the aeronautics, you know, association, et cetera. Now, these associations are going to be able to provide you, you know, a, information just for that activity, okay? They won't be able to be branched out. So the key when it comes to non-financial corporations is to have, a, you know, a business register. And when we talk about a business register, I'm not talking about a business listing, okay? A business listing, all it is, is just basically names, you know, uh, of companies. That's not a business register. A business register is actually going to show the births and deaths, you know, of institutional units, right? It's also going to have characteristic information that you could use, size, either total assets, total revenue, you know, uh, total operating profits. Um, it, it's also going to tell you, you know, the activity, you know, uh, that it's uh, involved in, the number of employees, et cetera. Very good char characteristic information that you need. But the power of the business register is that it keeps monitoring the companies, right? So wh whether there's continuous business in that activity, whether they merge with another one, et cetera. And if you really enhance the business register, what you could also do is you create you know, uh, what some countries have done, what they call key provider managers. So the, the team or the resources that are responsible for the business register, in addition to trying to get, you know, the most up-to-date information on companies, which they also have to do or perform is they have to have a liaison with the most important respondents in your economy, okay? And what, what that does is that that provides the respondent 
with a direct channel with a statistical office or the collector of the data. So if there's any problems, they have a direct contact. And at the same time, the statistical office now can approach them you know, in a much efficient manner. And that's very important to, to establish you know, that kind of engagement with your respondents. Okay? And the reason for that is that, let's say for example, yes, you're collecting non-financial data from them, but let's say you start thinking about, well, okay, let's say we want to do you know, some kind of environmental statistics. If you have a good relation with the respondent, you can easily pick up the phone and you know, contact the person that you know and say, look, we're trying to do this. Do you have any information that you can share with us? Or what do you think about this? Okay. So it's a way of trying to collect information without going through the formal process. Okay. So when we're talking about business register, again, it's much more than just, you know, a register, you know, of births and deaths, but it's also to be able to you know, create a liaison, you know, with, uh, with your respondents and build good relations with them. And at the same time, you know, in the economy, because, you know, these companies here, they, they go through, you know, um, cycles, there's problems with them. If you have a good relation with them, and let's say, for example, they're going through some hardship, either, you know, they're facing, you know, a downturn in their sales, or they might be going bankrupt. If you have a good relation, you can pick up the phone and contact them and say, yes, normally we request, you know, 50 variables from you. We know you're having a hard time. Can you provide us with whatever the key variables are, okay? Now, of course, this takes some time, some effort to establish that kind of relationship, but it's well worth it. Right. So in this box here, what I try to do is I try to show, well, when it comes to, you know, non-financial data corporations, we can try to put them into, let's say, for example, four silos. So it comes to you know, financial statements, publicly available financial statements, administrative data, surveys, and counterpart. And then basically on the rows, we're saying, well, okay, what would be the frequency, the timeless detail, consolidation, and coverage? So if you look at, for example, the, you know, the first column when it comes to public available information, and we look at the frequency, usually the frequency, you know, it could be annual, but now, with, again, with third-party providers, it's becoming much more frequent. So with public financial statements, it's usually the company's going to prepare information for their shareholders. Or if a big event is going to come, they're going to have some kind of you know, um, announcement that they would like to make. And that's the information that you try to pick up. But usually when it comes to the frequency, it's going to be either you know, annual or you know, um, some kind of sub-annual. Timeless. This is where now it's going to vary. It's going to more or less depend on the year end of uh, the company. So some companies have calendar year ends, some have you know fiscal year ends. Okay, so that's something that you're going to have to be aware of. When it comes to detail from from financial statements, you get some really good detail, but you're not going to get the granular detail that we require. Okay, especially when you look at, for example, on their asset side, on the financial asset sides, they're usually going to group things together, whereas we want to be able to have, you know, each item itemized, okay, each debt security that they hold, preferably itemized, not have their total, you know, uh, debt security holdings, uh, except there's limited detail that you can get. One of the biggest challenges is because consolidation. So when it comes to financial statements, usually the company's going to prepare a prospectus or financial statements for its global operations. Okay. And that means it's going to include, you know, activities outside of the boundary that you're trying to measure, outside of the domestic boundary. Okay. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to sift through the notes, because usually in the notes, you might be able to get some kind of regional breakdown, you know, uh, that might help you, um, et cetera. Okay. And when, when we're looking at coverage, well, the coverage is probably going to be very good when it comes to large companies because they have they want access to financial markets. It's not going to be very, very good when we're looking at, for example, medium or so small size companies or large private companies, right? Because they don't need, you know, uh, to provide financial statements to anyone, All right? So 
I'm not going to go through each of these buckets, but I just went through the, the first column and then you can follow through, then you can see what the advantages and disadvantages are for administrative tax data, you know, for surveys, and then for counterpart data. Okay. But I'd like to say a couple more words though, when it comes to, you know, surveys, you know, of non-financial corporations, if you're able to, you know, uh, build, you know, enterprise uh, surveys for them, you know, um, so basically, you know, the typical source that you're going to be able to get is what we call the income statement, right? And of course, the balance sheets. However, as you well know, when it comes to, you know, institutional sector accounts, especially, you know, um, the accumulation accounts, there's also two other accounts that we need information for, right? And as everybody will remember, as of yesterday, you need information for revaluation and volume changes. So when you're getting information just on income statements and balance sheets, you're going to have a challenge now on how to derive the two other sectors. Okay. And one of the examples I wanted to show you is how you can try, you know, um, to derive, you know, uh, you know, revaluations and volume changes, but we didn't have time. Maybe we'll, we can go through that, you know, um, tomorrow. However, the key here is you don't take the opening minus the closing balance and you assume that that is the transaction, especially when it comes to, you know, um, securities that are, you know, mark to market, okay? Now, there is some type of instruments, you know, usually the nominal types of instruments, the non-tradable instruments where you could do that okay so for example when we look at deposit liabilities you know of financial institutions they're not marketable correct so when you're seeing you know increases and decreases in domestic currency you can more or less assume that that is a transaction there is sometimes going to be you know another volume change you know, because there's sometimes there's going to be some kind of maybe an impairment uh, that could be involved, with, you know, with the deposits, but that's very rare. So it's for non-tradable securities, usually, you know, um, on the liability side, the, the change between the open and the closing is a good indicator for transactions. But when we're looking at securities that are marked for market, that's not the case. Okay. A little bit of delay. Okay. Now, when we look at the administrative tax data, just quickly looking at the benefits and the challenges of administrative ta tax data, one of the opportunities or the advantages, excuse me, of being able to access administrative tax data is that they're very reliable. Yes, you know, they weren't compiled for the national accounts. However, the information, you know, uh, contained in them should be very reliable, okay? And again, it can be used, you know, in, in to complement, for example, your surveys, okay? So what we find, you know, uh, with many economies is that usually the survey is going to be you know, geared for the large corporations. And it's usually gonna be a quarterly, you know, uh, sample of large corporations. And then what you what they normally would do is they're gonna supplement, you know, for the small and medium size with, you know, administrative tax data. Now, as we as was seen in the box, administrative tax data, unfortunately, is not very frequent, okay? And there's a, usually a, quite a bit of a time lag between you know um, access that you're going to get you know the um, the administrative tax data, a you have to wait till the end of the tax year, and again because we're talking about corporations here, legal entities, they're not not necessarily going to have a calendar year. They could report their tax statistics on a fiscal year, so usually there's going to be a delay of you know maybe 12 to 15 months before you can actually get the data, but. You know, at least, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money when it comes to small and medium uh, type uh, businesses, you can use this source, okay? And of course, you know, when we look at, you know, this type of source, it provides you with a good level, okay? So if you're able to access all the administrative tax data, that should give you a very, very good, 
you know, estimate for the formal economy. Okay. One of the drawbacks, as you all will know, is that you know uh, companies do not necessarily have to report all their balance sheet items. Right. So depending on you know, um, the, you know the the tax authority, they're going to have different rules and they're going to have different schedules. So then it's going to be up to the compiler to be able to negotiate either to get all the information, but even if you do get all the information, you know, in most cases, you're not going to get all the detail that the company has, okay? Because it's not actually needed um, for tax statistics. And then maybe the, the last thing that I, I would like to say when it comes to, uh, before I go to the summary for non-financial corporations is, you know, yesterday we talked about when, when we looked at equity and we know that in uh, business accounting, equity is basically the difference between assets and liabilities. But when it comes to, you know, the, um, the institutional sector accounts and balance sheets, equity is a liability. So when you look at non-financial corporations, what would be the net worth of non-financial corporations? equity is treated as a liability, the net worth of corporations in theory should be, sorry, but so the equity is treated as a liability. So the net worth for non-financial corporations should be, right? In business accounting, we say that assets minus liabilities equals net worth. Usually, hopefully, assets are greater than liabilities. So you have a positive net worth. You can have a negative net worth, you know, um, if a company is having some issues, so the liabilities are greater than their assets. But if equity is treated as a liability, the net worth in theory for non-financial corporations should be? Zero. Thank you, zero. Now, in practice, is it usually zero? So for the countries that are actually compiling balance sheets, when, for example, you look at the net worth of your non-financial corporation sector, is it zero? Does anyone want to volunteer? Well, yes, go ahead, please. First of, first of all, thank you very much, because this is a wonderful presentation and a wonderful approach that we could implement from the standpoint of explaining the sources of data. And I would like to add a little bit to what we are discussing right now. One of the things I would like to add is about the issues of your uh, examples about monetary and financial statistics. Uh, this is uh, national accounts. And in national accounts, uh, we can see in SNS the uh, 11th chapter that give you general ca character of understanding how the account should be built. But talking about monetary and statistics, uh, you should be centered on the processes. If you take this monetary statistics, as it has been said already, it is focused on residues. And in order to see the moment of the and the flows of resources, central banks, they have to change uh, their approaches in collecting monetary statistics and to use not the saldo balances, but uh, the back saldo balances that where we can see all movements on the transaction. Moreover, it is very important to mark that there exists certain uh, passage uh, because monetary statistics does not have that financial instruments and categories that we have in the financial account. You need to have some transition table. Uh, for example, we can uh, uh, attribute it to the households or some other processes should be attributed to non-financial corporations. Other positions should be re classified. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for another very important issue that you underlined, that the strategy is needed of data collection. This is really a very sensible and very important 
aspect because some information is really does not exist in the direct access you should very clearly understand who is being to be the provider of this data thank you very much or uh, that you mentioned about different suppliers of information because without that suppliers on the micro and small and medium-sized enterprises it's very hard to get data and another point that i would like to ask you about and maybe you could give us more details about it you manage mentioned business registers i think that our colleagues from other countries already have this experience of work with the business registers we're also compiling compiling business registers but they have to be transformed into the real business rest registers because we have just the register of legal units and i think this information is not sufficient in order to compile financial account as such what else i would would like to underline in your presentation you mark very correctly and very well but there i have a question we talk that when we assess uh, non-financial corporations or when we do the, the survey of them we have to understand the changes in volume or re reassessment uh, how should we systematize the balance of all that non-financial corporation because they belong to different sectors of the economy can you please give us more details about it that would be very useful for us but in general thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation Oh, okay, well, wasn't the answer that I was looking for, but um, all right, let me try to see if I can uh, address. First, the one thing I was going to say, um, um, when it comes to the business register, one of the things that it's very, very important when you actually undertake, uh, you know, to a development of a business register is the business register should also be able to give you, you know, um, the structure, you know, of, um, of the enterprise. And again, th that's very, very important because then you're going to know, you know, the, you know, the institutional units that are being consolidated, you know, within that structure. Okay. And, and that's good. And because one thing that we, we know we mentioned yesterday, when it comes, you know, to the, the, the national accounts, as opposed to the GFS, you know, we want unconsolidated data. Okay. So it's very important that you, you understand you know, and have a good, you know, um, image, you know, of what's the, what the corporate structure looks like. A, it's not, it's going to also help you, you know, to reconcile the data, you know, with the rest of the world, if parts of uh, the structure also include entities that are operating outside of your economy. But at the same time, it's also going to basically show you, you know, the direct linkages, you know, between, you know, the, the establishments, you know, and uh, the major parent company. Okay. Now, you know, to answer the, the, your question about, you know, the, the revaluations and the, um, the the volume changes, you know, th this is, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for a lot of countries and, and, it, and it's, we're recognizing this. Now, what, what's going to happen is that um, even when you look at surveys, you're going to get, for example, that's why I said you're going to get the, you know, the profit and loss of the revenue, the expenses, you're also going to get the balance sheet. Now, what some countries have done is they've created modules or a separate schedule to try to see if they're able to get the revaluation. Okay, so what you could do now again, you, you're going to have to be you know very very strategic in this, and you're going to probably you know when it comes to financial institutions, you're going to probably focus on the the major ones. So we're talking about here the pension funds, you know uh, perhaps you know the the insurance and your larger. I would say financial institutions. And what you could do is you could ask them, you know, or the way you would set up the questionnaire is to ask them if they can give you the book values, you know, of their securities and the market values of their securities. Okay. Now, if you're able to get that information, that's going to give you, you know, a good ratio of the market value to book value. All right. And that should be a very good indication, you know, of the revaluation. Okay. Again, it's an approximation. It's not perfect, but it, it's something, you know, that you can work with and you can, you know, uh, build upon. When it comes to the revaluation, you know, it, the thing is, is that for listed shares, again, if you have access to share prices, you should be able to, you know, 
run, you know, or create a database of, you know, of the securities that are being, you know, listed on your stock exchange, and you will be able to get market values readily available. And you'll be able to see changes between, you know, periods. Okay. And then what you're going to have to do, and I have another, another little example of that, how to actually uh, get flows, you know, from that, you're going to have to basically make sure that your opening balance, you've taken into account the price effect, and then you can determine, you know, the, the transaction and the revaluation. Okay. So when there is, you know, some kind of observable, you know, price, you know, market price, you know, it makes your job a little bit, you know, uh, less difficult. Right? Now, when it comes to volume changes, we know that volume changes are going to be, A, they're not transactions. We know that, right? Secondly, we know they can't be due because of prices. So it's going to be all other exogenous impacts that are happening or endogenous impacts that are happening that are not due to prices or because of transactions. So when it comes to non-financial corporations, you know, it's, it's quite e not quite easy, but the thing is, is that you know that it's going to be either due to, you know, um, natural disasters, it's going to be due to reclassifications, okay? So again, with a good business register, you'll be able to detect reclassification. That's very important when it comes to social sector accounts because reclassifications play a major role when it comes to uh, institutional sector accounts. So you could just think about, for example, you know, when a public company becomes a private company or when a private company becomes a public company. Okay. Similarly, you know, uh, there could be some instruments which are being reclassified. They're not gonna be treated as a transaction. They're gonna be reclassified. Okay. So when the volume change, you know, you know there have, there have to be specific, you know, incidents to trigger you know, the, the volume change. Getting the information on it, it is difficult at some time. For some of them, it's very, very difficult. Other ones, you know, you could get it depending on how you build your data sources. Okay. And again, you know, uh, what we're talking about, you know, the major uh, players. One good thing, you know, when it comes to financial statements, you know, uh, and other uh, publicly available information is they'll give you information on mergers and acquisitions. And again, when there's a merger and acquisition, you know there's going to be some kind of volume change, right? The asset existed before. Okay. So going through, you know, the prospectuses and other publicly available information might give you clues, you know, on what the, or the size of the, the volume change could be. Okay. And again, if you had built good relations with that respondent, then you can always pick up the phone and ask them for some more details that are not going to be available. Again, I, I know, uh, you know, maybe I come from, you know, a world where things, you know, are a little bit more simple and um, I guess a little bit more negotiable. Um, but I mean, these are things that, you know, you know, you have to understand because the other person on the other side is a human just like you, right? So you both have work to do and the thing is, if you build a relationship, you know, you'll be, you'll be pleasantly surprised that, you know, cooperation is going to be, you know, following soon. You know, and even though there could be, you know, some barriers uh, in, you know, in actually exchanging data, you know, I also believe that, you know, good relations could overcome some of those barriers. Maybe you're not going to get, you know, the exact micro information that you need, but you'll be able to get some kind, you know, of information that's going to give you a better, you know, informed judgment you know, of what you need to do. Okay. So back to my question. So we said that if we're going to treat equity as a liability, then net worth is going to be zero. And the question is, does that happen in practice? So if we go right now to, you know, Stats Netherlands, and we pull, for example, you know, the non-financial corporation, what are we going to see? What is the net worth for non-financial corporations? It's a net debtor. Okay. All right. And if we pull up, let's say, for example, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, what are we going to find? Probably it's not going to be zero, right? And now the question is, why is that? It should be zero. Right? If you liquidated the company, 
there can't be a residual value. In theory. So what does that point? That points out to that there, it could be problems, measurement errors. Okay. One of the measurement errors that you could have is that on the liability side, shareholders, for example, or investors, when they want to make a purchase, when they want to invest in a company, they're going to take into account certain things that we might have challenges in measuring. A good example, when you look at resource intensive industries, usually an investor is going to put a price on the future probability you know, of, you know, of, of oil being found in that company or, you know, of a profitable, you know, mine, et cetera. Okay. So on the liability side, we're usually going to get a better market value of the equity from the shareholder, from the investor's point of perspective. However, as national accountants, we have challenges in trying to put a measure, you know, on resource wealth, for example or on what will be the wealth of you know, uh, intellectual property products on the, from the asset side. On the liability side though, investors, because that's the market value, they're willing to pay because they're thinking that, oh, okay, you know, this brand name is worth X amount. You know, this you know, research that they've done is gonna be worth this amount. On, on that, when we're trying to measure assets, you know, we have challenges. We have problems, you know, trying to get a market value, you know, for intellectual property products. We have problems in trying to put a, you know, good value on resource rents, et cetera. So what usually tends to happen is that there's going to be a difference in the net worth of non-financial corporations. And that difference, that residual is due to the market valuation of the liability versus the current values of assets minus liabilities. Okay, but once you start seeing this thing really, you know, becoming volatile, variable, and growing, you should start thinking about okay, what is happening now in this sector. Okay, one injustice that we do in in the national accounts is you know we have a good breakdown of financial corporations. Every time there's a crisis, we add more sectors, additional instruments to get better coverage, but we don't do that for non-financial corporations. For non-financial non corporations, the prerequisite is one large sector that encompasses you know, numerous activities, right? Different types of assets, okay? So one thought that you should take back, yes, the recommendation, is to provide one non-financial corporation sector, but in your economies, you should try, if, if you're able, to try to get information for some of the important non-financial corporations, their activities. So for example, if agriculture is very, very important, maybe try to see if you can get a balance sheet for agriculture, et cetera. You don't have to you know, publicly you know, disseminate that information, but at least it's gonna help you you know, when you're putting together the sector, just as, you know, excuse me, it helps you when we're doing it for non-financial, for financial corporations, pardon. All right, so as a summary, for non-financial corporations, the sector, as we've been talking, is definitely a challenge in many countries, okay? And there's various approaches that we need to take in order to get, you know, um, data, in order to make you know, relevant you know, um, and timely statistics. We know that the source data is, is often not gonna be available, or when it is available, it could be imperfect. Okay. And a good, a good one of them, again, I'm going back to you know, the intellectual property products. A lot of times when you look at business accounting, the way they treat, for example, research and development and software is completely different the way the national accountants in business accounting, if there's not gonna be any economic future benefit to the intellectual property product, it gets expensed. Where that's not true, true for national accounts. We need to put a market value, okay? And you're gonna have compilation challenges, you know, whether, you know, 
you're, you know, you're trying to provide information on an annual basis and on a quarterly basis. Okay, there are going to be challenges in uh, in both types of uh, of frequencies. Okay. Now, one thing I didn't mention here, because when it comes to you know non-financial corporations, as I mentioned, you know, yesterday, yes, we can probably get you know counterpart information when it comes to their you know um, financial assets and liabilities, but in most economies, you know, non-financial assets are much more important than financial, okay? And one other thing that you have to keep in mind when it comes to non-financial corporations, they don't need to access, you know, funds from financial institutions. They have other means of getting, you know, um, you know uh, resources, right? They can issue their own securities, they can issue equity, et cetera, okay? So counterpart information, yes, definitely take a look at it but it's not going to be sort of like, you know, your silver bullet that's gonna solve all your problems when it comes to non-financial corporations. Okay. All right. So, so how am I doing in time? 10 minutes, yikes. Oh, well, so my assumption was right. Either I'm rambling on or my, uh, my assumption was correct. Okay, so there's not any further questions uh, for non-financial corporations. I'll move to my favorite sector, which is households. Now, households, you know, in my opinion, is the most important sector in the economy, right? At the end of the day, everything's gonna have to go through households. We do everything because of households, okay? And it's the most exciting uh, sector in my mind, maybe not for my colleagues, but for me, definitely. I'm not quite sure where we have all this uh, stuff in there. Is that me? I'm not sure if it's me or but that's okay. It's okay. I, it's fine. So just like non-financial corporations, households, you know, pose a challenge in many, many countries. Okay. So yes, you know, in not, not even, the, you know, when we're talking about institutional sector accounts, we have problems even when it comes to, you know, household final consumption expenditure. Okay. And we have equally uh, problems or challenges when it comes to Institute, you know, the, the accumulation accounts uh, for households, especially when it comes to balance sheets. Now, so the way we tackle households, you know, um, we could do it in a couple of ways. Some countries have surveys. Okay? They're very, very costly surveys. But some countries that I know of and that I've worked with what they do is they'll actually have a survey and similar to your household budgetary survey or a survey of living conditions, they're gonna have a survey on households, assets and liabilities. Okay. So they're gonna go, they're gonna sample and they're gonna get information on the assets and liabilities. Now, of course, you know, that's gonna provide us with some information how accurate is that information going to be is going to be another, you know, uh, thing that we're going to have to discuss and think about. So, for example, if I knocked on your door and I asked you how much did it cost you for that Van Gogh that you have in your living room, what are you going to tell me? Then, go ahead. That's a fake. It's not real. <laughs> That's a fake. So, in other words, we, we, you're going to have problems. You know, households are going to reveal, you know, as much as they are willing to reveal, but there's going to be certain things that are definitely going to be incomplete when it comes to service. But we need information from them. The good thing about surveys is that, and it's important again, because households, you know, again, are not homogeneous, right? When we look at households, you know, they're, they're different. So we need to be able to break them down into little chunks to be able to understand, you know, their, their vulnerabilities, to be able to understand their investment intentions, et cetera, okay? And without being able to do that, if you just have, you know, these sources that are coming, like say, for example, from counterpart sources, it's very important to have the counterpart sources, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to now the distributions that, you know, Gerard uh, talked about yesterday, and that's where the real, you know, um, interest uh, comes with the household sector, you're kind of stuck. 
okay? So for example, in a lot of countries, they look at the household sector and they're gonna produce estimates of, let's say, for example, credit market debt you know, to GDP, or they're gonna you know, maybe produce a, an indicator of you know, interest over credit market debt. And let's say we get a ratio. Let's say the credit market debt to GDP is 180%. And let's say the next quarter, it goes to 182%. Now with that aggregate information, what can we say? Yes, okay, go ahead, please. If the volume of debt is higher than the volume of GDP, then we have the situation that if this is in domestic market, if we discuss the domestic lending, then the country is huge borrower and it's collected the resources from the domestic market. If it also attracts uh, external suppliers of resources, then we can say that the country has high debt loads, debt burden from the external creditors. If we have 180% uh, of uh, a loan to GDP share. So you're absolutely right. On an aggregate basis, we can make, you know, all those statements. However, if I want to ask you, well, are the rich people getting richer? Are they getting more in debt? What's happening to the middle class? We don't know. So the problem with an aggregate number is that yes, we can make certain statements, but we can't really, you know, dissect and actually start analyzing what is happening, you know, in the economy to low income households, middle income households, retirees, etc. So just imagine, you know, if you had that information during COVID, you know, the analysis that you'll be able to do. So yes, when it comes to this sector, we have big challenges. Aggregate information is available from counterpart information for sure. So when we look at, let's say, for example, the key assets, key financial assets of households, their deposits, you can get good information from deposit-taking institutions because usually deposit-taking institutions have to you know, uh, decompose their liabilities by institutional sector, okay? One thing I forgot to mention, when you're looking at that data though, and especially when we're talking about non-financial corporations, I forgot to mention that, you gotta be careful because financial institutions don't have the same sector as national accountants, okay? So sometimes there are gonna be problems between non-financial corporations and governments. So for example, a state-owned company, right? A financial institution is gonna basically code it as what? Government or as non-financial corporation? So you got to be there's there's going to be differences in the activities that you know financial institutions are going to be classifying versus what we need you know as national accountants. One way that you can overcome that is hopefully if you have a business register, you can give them you know the metadata and say, well, this is what we want you know in these buckets, and that might help. But now let's go back to the household sector. So on the asset side, when we look at their currency and bank deposits. On an aggregate level, we're going to get good information. Similarly, when it comes to their pensions, especially if they're defined benefit pensions, and if you have a regular or a superintendent of you know, insurance and pensions, you'll probably be able to get good information on the assets of pensions for households, right? And the way we treat you know, pensions in the national accounts, in the institutional sector accounts, we know that the, you know the net worth is going to go back to the household sector as their assets. Okay. Similarly, when it comes to collective investment schemes, investment funds, the majority of investment funds are actually purchased by households. So, in most economies that you know uh, I've seen data for, I would say you know there's a very very large majority of you know. Um, Investment funds are held by households. So you can make the assumption when you're putting together the, you know, the mutual funds that most of those assets belong to the household sector. Okay. Then 
On the liability side, of course, households need financing. So they usually go to financial institutions. They are like banks or deposit-taking institutions, and there we're going to get good information from them. However, households can also borrow from family members. Right? It's not uncommon for a parent to lend money to his child to buy a home, to pay for the university, etc. There, you're going to have a little bit of a challenge. How are you going to get that information? Is it going to be significant? No. Should we worry about it? No. But anyways, it's a little bit of a data gap, but it's insignificant, which is fine. The big problem now is going to become with what are we going to do with real estate? Okay. And we know that, you know, in some economies, that's probably the most important asset for households. And it's an important asset, you know, generally, I think, for households. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to have to do now is that how we're going to get data for real estate or, you know, the stock, you know, of the residential housing. And maybe if they have, you know, uh, you know uh, dwellings for investment purposes. So here, again, you can try getting a survey. You can try looking at tax information because if a household rents you know, a dwelling in some economies that's taxable, maybe there's gonna be some kind of information you know, on an administrative tax form that you can try to see you know, the rental income and then you can try to make some kind of assumptions what you think the stock is going to be. Or, you can now try to look at other administrative data. It's not necessarily tax data, but it's other administrative data. So for example, if you have access to land registries. So usually, you know, uh, when a household is going to buy a home, there's going to be, you know, a land registry to transfer, you know, the ownership from one, you know, institutional unit uh, to the other. Or, again, I'm not sure, you know, in all your economies, but in some, in some economies, there's going to be, you know, a municipal, municipal tax role. So usually municipalities or lower level of governments are basically, you know, responsible for, you know, sewage, waste, road maintenance, and usually it's homeowners that usually have to pay taxes, you know, uh, to finance, you know, these improvements, right? And usually those taxes are based on the value of the home, okay? So if, in your economy, you can get some kind of an assessment of the value of the homes, then that will give you a good approximation for uh, um, the stock of dwellings. Failing all which, we don't have any of those, what are we gonna do? Well, you know your counterparts above the line need to record gross fixed capital formation. It's a flaw, right? And we have manuals that tell us how to transform these flows into stocks. Very data intensive. The perpetual inventory model is very, very data intensive. It requires you know, a lot of price information, but with, there is sort of like you know, um, a method to help you to transform flows into stocks and you can try to put them into your balance sheet. Okay. What else? Um, now, but included in this sector, we also have, you know, what you know, I refer to as unincorporated businesses or self-employment. And they're gonna pose another challenge when it comes, you know, um, to compiling information. A, they're not quasi-corporations because they can't provide a full balance sheet of information. So we can't move them into the non-financial corporation sector. Usually, you know, you're gonna to try to get information here from, if you're, have, if you're able, from in, or personal income tax forms. Because with personal income tax forms, they have to report, hopefully they have to report their self-employment income. Maybe there's going to be, a, you know, some kind of balance sheet items. Maybe you'll be able to get liabilities for self-employed. Uh, maybe you're not gonna get. The problem when it comes to, you know, these type of, um, institutional units, it's extremely difficult to differentiate the person from the business. Okay. So that's why we put them together in, in the household sector. And it's, it's very, very, very difficult to try to get information, you know, to be able to split them. Some countries have tried doing that, you know, through, like I said, tax information, 
how accurate that tax information is, it's very difficult. And I'll just give you a quick example. So for example, let's say, you know, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a consultant and, I, you know, I work for myself and I have a little small office and I go to the bank and I get myself a credit card and I use that credit card for my business. And then I use my credit card for gas and I use my credit card for personal consumption. When I put together my tax statistics and I, I want to show my expenses, how accurate do you think I'm going to remember that I use my credit card for my groceries or maybe for a dinner or for my supplies? Right? It's very difficult. Now, you, you know, obviously being you know, self-employed, I'm going to try to overestimate my expenses. So of course, I'm going to include certain things that I shouldn't be including, et cetera. Okay? But it poses challenges. Yeah. Sorry? I missed. So, um, the last thing I'm going to say when it comes to, um, and this is, we're going to talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, both when it comes to non-financial corporations and households. The other thing that we could do is we could look at now the sequence of accounts to try to help us, you know, um, to actually, you know, verify the estimates. So when we look at the vertical balancing, we're going to try to, you know, um, help, you know, either the, the financial accounts based because we're going to probably, you know, assume that what's coming from above the line is much more accurate and much more comprehensive than what we have in the financial accounts. Okay. So you can look at, you know, the, the vertical balancing that could help. And of course, there's also the horizontal balancing, but the horizontal balancing, you got to be a little bit careful because compilers do have a tendency to I was to residually treat the household sector, which is not, you know, a good practice, but um, I've seen that done uh, as well. So I'm going to stop here. I know I only have a couple of minutes. Um, so I don't know if you have any additional questions for me, um, but like I said, I'm not going to cover, you know, uh, the government and public sector statistics. I mean, there's a very, very good manual. You have uh, the GFS you know, 2014 that you can look through. I put a couple of slides in there. Um, if you need more information, let me know and I can give you, you know, a full presentation that you can take with you on uh, the public sector. And the similar, you know, when it comes to the balance of payments and international investment position. I think, you know, I'll have a good grasp, you know, of those data sources. But if you do need, you know, um, some additional information, let me know and I can definitely send you uh, those presentations. Right, so. Thank you for your presentation. I think that because we don't have a lot of time, we are not able to discuss all the details of the problems with the sources of data in the household sector. It's not clear for me, given that we don't compile financial accounts. To evaluate, uh, to grasp, this is quite difficult. What are the difficulties related to households? You mentioned buying real estate. What are the challenges for financial accounts related to real estate transactions of households? Can you go into details on this one? Yeah, definitely, I could. But before I answer that question, one thing that, um, and unfortunately I didn't prepare a slide, but um, what you should do, especially, you know, for the, the economies that are starting out, you know, um, to develop institutional sector accounts, you should get yourself like a nice grid. Okay? And in that grid, you can put down the high level sectors and write down all the information that you have for those sectors. Put them in, in a silos, you know, saying if whether you have tax information for non-financial corporations, whether you have this source for financial corporations, whether you can get this source. Once you put all like the inventory, you have you build an inventory of all your data sources, then the second stage of your grid is try to take that inventory and try to put it into instruments and say which data source can help me now to measure the instrument. Once you finish, you're going to see, and, and I've done this for a, a couple of countries. 
you're going to see where the data gaps are. Okay, and then that's going to give you a clue of what's missing, what you need to do, you know, in the future to enhance your system. Okay. But now to answer your question, you know, what the challenge is, you know, with, with real estate is because, you know, real estate is a very, very important asset for non for households and for non-financial corporations, but especially for households. And as I mentioned, you know, yesterday, you know, there's price volatility is quite extreme. So as you can see now all over the world, house prices have increased, you know, in North America, you hear stories of, you know, 20, 30% in the UK, you know, house prices have increased by X amount, et cetera. So there's a huge revaluation that is going on with, uh, with this asset that you need to take care of. Why do you need to take care of it? Because the revaluation has a wealth effect. Okay? When the house price increases, you can borrow now more money because when you go to the bank, let's say you bought a house for 100,000 units, okay? And it increased by 50%. So today it's worth 150,000. You paid, let's say for example, you paid 100,000 and you had a mortgage of 80,000. So you had an equity of 20,000 when you bought the home because you put a down payment. Now the home is worth 150,000. You have an unrealized gain now of 70,000. 20, which was your down payment, 50 now because the market price increased. You can go now to a financial institution and say, hey, look, I'm richer than you think. I bought the house for 100. Now my house is worth 150. I have 70,000 of potential equity. Financial institutions are going to lend you now more money. When they lend you this money, you can increase your consumption. You can take your family to a trip. You can, you know, add, you know, maybe another bedroom in your home, et cetera. Okay. That extra economic activity increases GDP. It's a huge stimulus, right? On the reverse side, now everybody's calling that, oh, look, you know, there's going to be a bubble in the housing market. It's going to crash. If prices crash, and let's say they, they are going to crash, things go up, things go down. What's going to happen then? If you borrow that money and now your house is worth, let's say, 50000 what are you going to do? Are you going to walk away? You bought the house for 100 so you owe 80000 You borrowed another seventy, dollars now 150000 but now your house is worth 50000 What are you going to do? Are you going to tell the bank here or the financial institution, here's my keys, and you're going to walk away? You're going to declare bankruptcy? Are you going to stop eating? How are you going to now be able to finance, you know, uh, that additional resource that you took earlier? Okay. So it's very important to see the size, you know, of, uh, of, of, the, of real estate, you know, and, what, and how it's going to impact you know, the, the, the wealth of the households and their future consumption uh, patterns, okay? And again, you know, uh, and it's because, you know, the, the, with, with housing, it gives you a leverage. You're able to borrow money. And then the question is going to be, do you, are you going to have, you know, uh, resources in the, in, the, in the future and in the present to pay for that, okay? And then, of course, when, when we look at that, it, it doesn't only impact the household sector, right? If you walk away, what does it mean? If I lend you the money, now I have a house. I don't want the house. So there's going to be systemic risk now to the financial institution, okay? So you can see there's, there's going to be a domino effect, okay? So that's why it's very, very important you know, when we look at, you know, the, especially the, the institutional sector accounts, they provide us information that you're not going to find in GDP. GDP is important. It tells us certain things about, you know, the, the strength of the economy. When we look at the sector accounts, it gives us other, you know, clues of what could be going on, the behavior, you know, of the institutional units, you know, their vulnerabilities. You know, when we look at the household sector, and especially when we look at their assets, we have to always ask ourselves, do they have sufficient savings for the future? 
right? When we look at their investments in financial assets, we want to know what are they investing in because that's going to be part of their, you know, pension, if you will, in the future, right? So it also gives an indication what could happen to future consumption, right? So we're always going back to this loop. That's why households are the, the engine of all economy. At the end of the day, everything goes through households. Without households, we don't have anything. Okay? So it's important to be able to measure households, you know, actually, or as exactly as possible. And like I said, on the, on the liability side, you, you, you're going to get the most important, you know, li you know uh, liabilities. You know, you're going to be missing certain things, but you're going to get the most important things. On the asset side as well, you'll probably be able to get good, you know, financial assets. But some things, especially when it comes to, you know, non-financial, that's where you're going to have challenges. Okay. But going back, you know, to my initial statement, the key is, because now you're starting out, start by creating this inventory list. And then, you know, you can put it into, you know, smaller buckets. If you need, I can, you know, I can provide you maybe with a spreadsheet just to start you off if you want to see that how you would actually go ahead and do something like that. Okay, okay thank you, Emmanuel. Um, thank you very much. I want to say thank you for letting us to present our country. So I'm Goran Christoski. I'm coming from the Financial Accounts Unit at National Bank of Republic of North Macedonia. I've been working at financial account units for almost two years, so I'm still in the process of learning. So I will try to do my best and to show you, present you how we compile financial accounts uh, statistic and how we develop and our progress. Okay, so just this is okay. So the primary responsibility of the National Bank is to compile annual and quarterly financial accounts. This is declared or at the Annex 2 to the Memorandum of Understanding in the area of macroeconomic and financial statistics between National Bank, State Statistical Office, and Ministry of Finance. And the, de the data exchange is arranged, is, uh, arranged with technical agreement on the manner of data exchange for the purpose of financial account statistic between the three responsible institution. So uh, our compilation of annual financial and quarterly financial accounts is regulated by our national laws, as well as we have a program of statistical survey, which we are updating every five years. So currently we are using 2018 to 2022. And in our national system, the compilation of non-financial accounts is responsible of state statistical office. And also we have been established in interinstitutional cooperation through three former working groups with uh, membering, uh, the members are from National Bank, Ministry of Finance and State Statistical Office. And that is the commission for sector classification, financial accounts and EDP working, working group in order to establish consistency of the national account system. So as, other EU, EU candidates countries, we, are, we have our responsibilities to report to international institution. So to Eurostat, we are responsible to deliver table six, table seven, table 27, as well as MIP indicators. And also we are preparing a general government financial accounts and deliver to the state statistical office as an input for table three and four of EDP, because state statistical office is the responsible institution for EDP working tables and questionnaire. And uh, also we are obligated to distribute quarterly financial accounts and tables on stock and flows to the ECB, as well as because we are adherents of the IMF SDSS plus, we have disseminated the sectoral balance sheets, quarterly data, as well as debt in uh, securities quarterly data according to the principle from whom to whom. And currently we are disseminated to Eurostat part of table seven, which I will talk later about the tables that we are delivering. And also from the last month, we uh, publish the 
debt security indicator on quarterly basis, according to the principal from to whom, and also we disseminate it to the IMF. Uh, and also we are obligated regularly to product and disseminate this indicator. So for doing this and to, for developing the financial account statistic and to be able to publish in the previous years, our, my colleagues did a lot of activities to be able to develop financial accounts. So they, we did a detailed analysis of the financial requirements, analysis of existing data sources, identifying new data sources, as well as we establish bridge tables, which means linking primary statistic data, monetary other financial institution and external statistic and their automation. Also, we've been established a centralized database for sectorization, which is regu regularly updated with quarterly and annual data from state statistical office in order to provide consistency of statistic in the terms of the sector. And also we, we, we had an internal working group on financial account statistic with a member of the other department of statistic as well as other uh, and other employees in, from the national banking in other department to be able to, and they were meeting regularly on quarterly basis with the primary aim to publish financial accounts. And they did it successfully. Also, we, have, we had a project for development of IT solutions for securities issues and trade on domestic market in order to provide comprehensive data on equity and debt securities. Also, we established and we are continuing to have a great cooperation with State Statistical Office and Ministry of Finance in order to identify new data sources and interinstitutional data exchange in the area of, of government statistics. We also participate in lots of projects on the national account uh, area, area, technical missions, and study visits on financial accounts. And also, we did it a general government statistical statistic developed project with IMF expert. And also with, uh, with the help of IPA 2019, we have a twinning project, uh, which was led by the National Bank uh, to aim to develop quarterly financial accounts and annual flows. And the result was a pilot version of financial accounts for the period of one year, annually quarterly stocks and flows on unconsolidated and consolidated basis. About the current status, we are, as I told you before, from December 2020, we published financial, financial account stocks for all sectors, subsectors, and financial, financial instruments on a non consolidated basis. And the set of tables consists of data on five sectors with nine subsectors and eight instruments with 11 sub instruments. The time series of data is for the period 2013 2020. And it's presented in our national currency. And also we are we prepared a methodological explanation for data series. And as I told you about table table seven, from since 2017, we are transmitted to Eurostat on a regular basis, a regular annual basis ex experimental data for restricted uses, table 0720 and table 0725. And from the last year, we flagged the data from table 0720 to be published by the Eurostat aligned with our national publication. As I told you about the EDP, we are preparing the financial accounts general government since 2018 and disseminated to the state statistical office for, for each sector, central government, local government and social security funds with data on stocks, transaction, uh, revalu revalorization and other changes on consolidated and non-consolidated basis. Uh, in the terms of uh, compilation method, uh, our, we, we, we are producing interrelated two-dimensional matrices with a separate matrix for each sector and subsector, where assets and liabilities vis-a-vis -vis other sector and subsector are broken down by financial instruments. And the basic uh, compilation principle that we are using for preparing these uh, matrices is from whom to whom which means that one financial liability by instruments for a particular sector represent an assets on the basis of the very instrument in the re relevant counterpart sector. And uh, this, a lot, a lot of two-dimensional matrices, we aggregate them in, uh, is, and we link in the aggregate metrics 
which is broken down by assets and abilities of each sector and subsector by financial instrument on growth basis. Uh, as we all know that financial account statistic is a secondary statistics, which uses the primary statistic that is available in national bank as well as other additional data sources, such as administrative and granular data. Uh, the compilation is really, really complex because the different data that we are using uh, usually, usually are for the, the, uh, the other statistics, so they may be a set on a different methodological basis. So in terms when we have a multiple data sources for the same data, we are, uh, we are based on the hierarchical setup of data sources. So we, uh, we rank the, uh, the multiple data sources, and we are choosing the one that has a better methodological compliance with ESA 2020, sectoral consistency, timeliness, satisfaction scope, and et cetera. And because the, this statistic, because it's the secondary statistic, is also is using like a corrective mechanism for further improvements on the primary statistic. when we see some discrepancy for the same instrument. And also the complexity of these sources. I have two metrics. Can I go to the sign? Like to select? It's linked. No. Maybe at the end. You know, there's a link on the sign if you click. Yes. Yes. And uh, this is the matrix, two dimensional matrix that we are compiling. So here, I don't know if you can see. Yes, we have a different primary statistic that we are using for each financial uh, instrument for the sector and subsector. And we can see that for some uh, financial instruments, we have a multiple data sources. And this is because depending of the counterpart information that we are getting, we have multiple data sources. This is one for the financial assets. Also we have on the financial liabilities, the same metrics. We can go back. And uh, about the data sources that we are using, uh, the, a lot of data sources, especially for monetary and office statistics, as well as extra statistics, uh, we are getting a monthly and quarterly data. So this will help us to prepare and compile in the quarterly financial accounts. So for the monetary on office statistic, we are using national bank balance sheet, balance sheet of deposit taking corporation except the central bank, balance sheet of other financial institution. Also for the external statistic, we are using the data they are preparing for compiling balance of payments and international investment position. That means we are using uh, trade credit with non resident data, loan balloon with no resident, investment equity invested in and from the rest of the world, and etc. And also for the non financial corporation and government, we use the annual financial statements. Uh, we are getting aggregate data by the state statistical office, and also we have individual data from the central registry database that we are having. And uh, data on securities, security by security, we are getting from the central security depository. And we are getting the data for the debt and equity securities issued and trade on the domestic market. And for the data on general government, we are using the database from the Ministry of Finance. And also, uh, when we have some dilemmas, some issues, we are getting additional data information from the website of the corporation and the institution. And also for the household and non-profit institution serving household, we, as we are getting the, the most of the information from the counterpart sector. And also that is our residuals that we are getting. And we making, when we have some issues, also some expert judgment. About the SAFA compilation system, as I told you, with the twinning project we, from the IAP 2019, uh, we, are, we, were, we, we started to implement the Croatian National Bank technical solution, which is aimed to ensure efficient and systematic process for compiling and transmitting the full set of financial account data and an reported data stock and flows to European institution. So I will try to explain you a little bit how is it works. 
So the data from the different data sources that we are complying in working tables, we are complying it with unified structure. And then this system automatically aggregate this all working tables with all the combina combination of the sector, subsector, counterpart sector, and financial institute, uh, instruments. After that, it provides uh, two dimension, uh, the two-dimensional matrices for the whole sectors and subsectors. And also uh, uh, after and uh, they also it aggregates in the one matrix and automatically uh, fills the transmission ISA, S ISA table that needed to be distributed to Eurostat. And also it converts to SDMX in this system, automatically converts to SDMX file needed required by the Eurostat. About our strategy, so we are planning to combine and publicate quarterly financial accounts next year, 2023. And also in the near future, we are, because we are have development, we are in the process of developing, if we have experimental data, we are planning to combine, compile and uh, of annual and quarterly sector financial accounts flows. And at the end to, uh, to get a full compliance with the, with the European and international statistic, statistic requirements and to be more harmonized with other countries. And at the end, I want to tell you briefly about the real data that we, we already published. So we can see from this graph that the data is from 2013 to 2020. And we can see that for the whole period, we are, we are net, we have ne negative net financial, uh, net financial world, which is deepening year by year. And uh, in 2020, it's like 68.5 percentage of GDP, which is increasing by the previous year uh, by 6.6 .6 percent point, which also this is the, the reason that about this increasing has also the GDP fall because it's in relative terms, but also in absolute terms, we have increasing about 22 billion dinners. That is around 357 million euros. And if we analyze sector by sector, we can see that uh, households and non-profit institutions serving households, as well as rest of the world for the whole period are net creditor. Uh, uh, that finance the other sector, and that is non-financial cooperation and general government. And we can see the green, the green uh, box is the uh, financial sector, corporation, uh, financial sector. And we can see because he's an intermediate sector that he has almost balanced net financial position. And dynamically analyzed, the deep and negative net financial flows is a percentage of GDP is deteriorated negative because of the government and non-financial corporation, which is partially offset by the improvement of the household sector. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Goran, for this uh, very good and inspiring presentation. Must I am really impressed by the work you have been doing over the past few years, and I think it's can really be seen as an example also for other countries. And I really also like the way you practically solve issues once you encounter them. But I'm sure there are some questions from the room for you. Otherwise, I'm also looking at the discussants. Well, I have one question, actually. I was looking at uh, the MOU. So it's one memorandum of understanding for all three. So for the yes. National Bank, yes. the Statistical Office and the Ministry. Yes. Was that the case from the start or was one institution added I later? I think you know? that it was the case for, from the start, but I'm not very sure because as I told you, when I came in the Financial yeah. Accounts Unit, they already have it. So yeah. maybe I will ask my colleagues and I will, I will but I think it was from the... Start. I ask because back in Iceland, we are, we are and thinking... And also, sorry to interrupt you, my mm -hmm. colleagues, she works as State Statistic Office, so she, yeah, she can answer this question. Maybe. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know better than Goran, maybe. <laughs> I'm in State Statistical Office over 20 years, so I think that uh, maybe... I will not um, uh, exact uh, year, but 
2008, I think that it was maybe earlier, I don't know, the first memorandum. So there are annexes uh, during the, these years, past years, and uh, all three institutions are involved in this memorandum of, of understanding, and nowadays they, uh, it is uh, updating some new things and everything. So it, the, the three institutions in all this and a few years ago, many years ago. Thank you, thank you. Just very practical question. Do you have these uh, memorandums and annexes available only in Macedonian language or we could have something that we could share with others? I'm not sure, maybe it's in English maybe because so. I, I'm not sure. We could and see. also because nowadays it's uh, updating, maybe we should, uh, we can, do in English. I, I'm not sure about that. I but we could it's you like to be sent if we have or I can ask my colleagues. Well, uh, actually, when we made the survey into the countries, many countries uh, ex express interest to uh, see, to share experience and to see how the institutional arrangements are arranged in the more advanced countries that already have compilation of financial accounts. And I think it's uh, helpful ones uh, like uh, I know Turkmenistan, but also D7, they are at the moment discussing how to arrange the distribution of responsibility, it's it's helpful when they prepare their own memorandums to see something available. Okay, I will ask. Uh, if you have, it's yeah, just, uh, of that's course. Uh, no problem. And Excuse me, only to add that this memorandum is not only for financial statistics, uh, financial accounts or financial things that it is uh, about everything that we share during the years between these three institutions. I believe Turkmenistan has the question. Sorry, I couldn't see. Thank you very much for the work that you've been conducting. This is a wonderful experience. I have a question on the last slide. You said you have such certain strategy, how you conduct this information brainstorming and the strategy on data exchange. Do you have some formalized variant of that strategy? Is it written down maybe in some sectorial program uh, how you uh, have to conduct that accounting? Or do you have some documents or some institutional documents that you could share with us as well? This is first question. Second question applies about the matrix from whom to whom. Do you do this matrix separately on every separate sector or every separate instrument? Can you please explain? But thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation and thank you very much for this huge work that you are conducting. Thank you very much. Uh, about the document, you asked me about the docu documents for the midterm strategy. Do we have some? documents i don't think so we have i'm not sure about that maybe i will also ask my colleagues for this question but i don't think so and about the metrics metrics uh, as i told you we are from the primary statistic data we are compiling uh, working tables with combination for the sector and subsector counterpart information and financial financial instruments. We are doing that, that manually from the data sources, from different data sources, we are combining them, et cetera. And uh, the final metrics, the system that I told you is providing automatically. We don't need to enter the cell in the metrics. Uh, the the FA completion system that we are using automatically do that, but we are, uh, we are preparing the master, we call it master tables for the whole combination for the whole for the all sector subsectors all counterpart sector and financial instrument that's how we do it what about households? How often do you conduct your household surveys in order to take them into account in their financial accounts? Because the households are staying 
the area that is not uh, covered completely. Maybe you can get something from banking system, something from financial corporations, but the majority of households, they stay at the level of surveys. Maybe you are using some uh, assessments, uh, some uh, symmetrical calculations, average calculations. Share with us this information. What do you do with households? Yes, uh, about the household, we don't have currently survey. So all the data that we are compiling for the households, it's from the counterpart sector. And also is uh, especially for the equity is the residuals for, especially for the, the unlisted shares and the other equity. So the household, we don't have any survey, something like that. We just use the counterpart information and also uh, our residuals the, for the for the data data that we don't have counterpart sector. So it's really a bit yeah strange. Thank you very much. Welcome. In the back. We have another question about the data on non-financial corporations. The data that you receive, for example, from business statistics, uh, how do you do any corrections? Do you do any amendments to apply them to your financial accounts? Maybe some additional calculations are done. Or you are just using them directly into your tables without any amendments. Uh, for the general information that we are using for non-financial corporation is is the, the the same data that they are providing the central registry databases we are getting uh the data for every uh, non-financial corporation from the the, uh, the most for the balance sheets and also uh for especially i will tell you again for the equity for other equity uh, especially for uh, because we don't have information for the counterpart sector with which ones owns the company. So uh, here we did also some estimation. Uh, we, we are using some percentage from the uh, how, how, how is the ratio of non-financial corporation from, uh, from the listed shares. We are doing some calculation. So yes, we are doing some calculation, but a lot of data that we are using is the raw data that we are getting for, because we are getting uh, annually uh, uh, individual data for the central registry. And now is the, uh, because when we, we were planning to compile quarterly financial accounts, uh, also it's a little bit difficult for the non-financial comparison here, because we have to do a lot of more estimation than annual. Maybe one last question also. Uh, I saw that that one of the more recent developments is the development of a of a sector sector database. Sector data. sector database, a database with units, and was the, is it is it a database where you allocate sectors to units sector classification? Uh, which I remember. For. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. It's no, the no. centralized database for sectorization. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and that is something that the central, that the national bank has? No. The, this center, just a second. This central is database for sectorization. Yeah. Uh, they, the, the state statistical office here uh, updated this quarter annual data because they are getting information mm. about the new enterprises that are opening some they are yes. liquidating so there uh, she can also talk, tell something more about that yes we have uh, one commission for sectorization uh, between uh, four or five uh, institutions national bank state statistical office central register ministry of finance four and uh, we discuss maybe when there are some uh, uh, cases that so uh, we don't know where to put uh, which sector is uh, all together we decide but our role in uh, for state statistical office is uh, the main uh, uh, role 
And uh, we have from central register, we have all uh, units, they have uh, sector already uh, when they with the data, when, they, when we receive their financial statements. For one, for uh, maybe for some of them, we make decisions uh, together all. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Once again, uh, thanks, uh, Koran. Uh, Maybe briefly, only to comment something, to admire the National Bank team, because they work, I don't know how many, maybe 10 or less years. We work maybe over uh, 15 years on non-financial, in state statistical office on non-financial accounts. We haven't uh, until now published nothing yet. And uh, Eurostat uh, did not, uh, they don't know uh, especially, uh, that uh, we have such a work done since, uh, I don't know, 2008, but now we, and also that uh, we, concerning that we talk about yesterday about consistency, we don't have consistency, especially in uh, non-financial corporations and households. There are big, uh, uh, there is a big discrepancy. But uh, now on uh, IPA 2019, we are we have uh, one activity, especially uh, to consistency, also between non-financial and financial uh, uh, accounts. So thank you to Goran, but especially that he's I think that he's the youngest man there, and this is not what uh, this this uh, that I'm telling now is not agreed between two of us, but only to. to <laughs> Thank him that he's a great. Thank you. Thank you for the addition. And thank Goran is happy to take the compliments. Yeah. Uh, I'm not <laughs> going to ask how old you are, Goran, but, uh, <laughs> but also my thanks for this presentation and also for the questions. I think that's really one of the goals of this uh, uh, workshop to also learn from each other. And I think this is a good example of all the work you've been doing. And one question I had, how big is the team? How big is the team? Yeah. We are five members now. Five. From the uh, before four months, we have one more employee. So we were four. That makes the work even more impressive. So thanks a lot. And also you from the statistical office, I think the corporation and you rightfully says, okay, we, we made a huge effort, but we're still not there. And I think that fully fits the message we're trying to convey uh, to do this workshop, that it's step by step and gradually improving the quality. And that I think, again, is a very good example. Uh, so we then move to the uh, second uh, country presentation. Thank you of again. That will be done by Turkey, uh, and I will uh, give the floor to, well, I, how do I pronounce it? It's Bursa, Bursu, Bursu. So the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Burcu. Uh, I'm working in the Monetary and Financial Data Division at the Central Bank of Turkey. Uh, my presentation will be about the uh, data sources we are using and our experiences. So I'll start with um, uh, showing what we produce, and then I'll go to our data sources and the challenges we are facing. We are producing um, quarterly financial accounts and um, publishing it in our website. Uh, the latest data is for um, second quarter of this year. Uh, we are um, publishing our metadata and also revision policy with uh, the data. Uh, also, we are publishing our institutional sector list to give an idea what, uh, which sector covers which institutions. Uh, we are transmitting uh, data to international organizations as well. Um, for Eurostat, uh, we are we have annual transmissions, uh, so we have both consolidated and non-consolidated stocks and transactions. Uh, we also produce other changes in volume accounts and valuation adjustments. Uh, as of this year, we started to uh, transmit Table Twenty Seven 
to Eurostat. Uh, we are also transmitting the same similar data to OECD, and we are transmitting quarterly data to the BIS. Uh, we are also, with, uh, along with the um, data, we are uh, producing uh, a quarterly report. It is basically uh, descriptive statistics about the uh, latest quarter. Uh, and um, we are giving um, latest developments at sectoral level. We are also showing uh, some key indicators like debt to GDP or debt to uh, household debt to um, disposable income and our rankings with the um, European or other peer countries. Uh, there are also two blog papers written uh, by our colleagues uh, about um, the household total debt and uh, household indebtedness levels. Uh, they are basically uh, communication tools to show how uh, how researchers can use uh, financial accounts. Uh, we also had um, a workshop on the use of financial accounts in 2019. And uh, on this workshop, we uh, co-authored and we re write um, two papers uh, with the Irving Fisher Committee uh, of the IFC. There is also one thesis work uh, done uh, by our colleague uh, about uh, the use of financial accounts. It is in Turkish. So data sources, um, I think the first two presentations also cover the same thing. So I am going to pass the slides um, uh, quicker, but uh, this is the list, uh, the potential data sources that we might have at the sectoral level. And also we can, um, we have, we can go to the instrument level after uh, identifying the potential data sources for the sectors. We are going to the instrument levels. Uh, administrative data and um, the macroeconomic statistics compliant with international standards it comes first. Uh, for households, for example, you can use survey data, but in Turkey, we, in Turkey, we don't use it. So when you have uh, multiple resources, um, you need an, a hierarchy. Uh, what we do is we um, first use the um, statistics, which is compliant with international standards like IIP and GFS. And uh, we, then we use uh, regulatory and supervisory data if it is available. And also we uh, use um, statistics which is published with metadata. It is also usable. Um, in this part, I'm going to share our data sources sector by sector. For non-financial corporations, we have two um, major data sources. One is balance sheets, but it is annual. And the other is counterpart data, which uh, come from mostly money and banking statistics, IIP. And also we have security statistics, uh, security by security database, which we produce. Uh, also we have uh, financial accounts of other sectors, which we compile directly from their balance sheets. So we use them as counterpart data. What we do is uh, we use counterpart counterpart data as the main source, but complement it with the annual balances uh, for um, currency, shares and other equity and other accounts receivable uh, and payables items. Um, since these uh, figures are uh, annual, we calculate quarterly values uh, by using GDP growth rate. These are the data sources for each specific financial instruments. Um, I can go over it, but it is, yeah, uh, mostly money and banking statistics and uh, IIP. We are using them uh, extensively. We also use security statistics for securities issues and holdings. Uh, for a financial sector, we cover all the subsectors except the captive financial institutions and money lenders sector. 
Um, for best of our knowledge, there is no institution identified as captive financial institutions yet for us. So we do not have data on it. Uh, so central bank uh, uh, data is directly compiled from its accounting records. Uh, deposit taking corporations from money and banking statistics. We are uh, computing market value for listed shares. Uh, for uh, investment funds, we get data from electronic fund trading platform. And for other financial intermediaries, we use various uh, sources. For example, we use uh, statistics produced by Capital Markets Board. And also we use data source that is shared with us uh, by Banking Regulation Agency for uh, financial leasing, factoring and finance companies, also asset management companies. And we directly uh, collect data from a uh, Turkey Wealth Fund Management Company. A uh, financial auxiliary sector is um, compiled directly from these institutions' balance sheets. So um, we ask them if they don't have some detailed uh, detail that we need, we ask them to prepare a more detailed balance sheet and they are sending it to us. Uh, insurance companies, uh, the, uh, data come from different sources. Minister of Finance and Treasury is one data source. Also, we are collecting data from um, natural catastrophe insurance pool and also agricultural insurance pool. And we are, again, uh, calculating the market value for listed shares. So we are doing consolidation for uh, financial institutions. Uh, we are first consolidating uh, monetary and financial institutions, then consolidating MFIs with other financial subsectors. Uh, the general government sector is um, directly compiled uh, using by, by using government finance statistics. So for this sector, we are not using counterpart data. Uh, for households, um, we only use counterpart data. Uh, all the instruments are um, compiled through using uh, money and banking statistics or security statistics or IIP. Only currency is calculated as the residual. So after getting the currency holdings of all other sectors, we are computing the uh, holdings of a household sector as a residual. Um, for non-profit institutions serving households, the um, practice is similar to non-financial corporations. So we have annual data from Turkstat, uh, annual balance sheet data, and we also have counterpart high frequency data. Uh, for MPish, we are using balance sheets for currency and shares and other equity items. And rest of the world, um, it is uh, mainly invest in IIP and balance of payments, but we complement them with uh, money and banking statistics and also financial accounts of other sectors. Uh, for example, uh, we are uh, using money and banking statistics for currency and deposits. Also, we uh, complement the uh, data on loans and equity from the uh, financial accounts of uh, financial intermediaries and financial auxiliaries subsectors. Uh, it is uh, similar for the liabilities side of the rest of the world. And um, so we have uh, some challenges ahead of, uh, we are working on uh, producing an integrated accounts for the country. So um, it is a major challenge for us now. Uh, also, we are going to uh, adapt for SNA 2025. And um, we are also working on to produce uh, a fixed denominated financial accounts for for um, inner purposes and also for, of course, to um, to be able to uh, calculate revaluations more accurately. So uh, we need to improve data quality 
for this, uh, we want to make a counterpart study with the Minister of Treasury and Finance. And also we have some timeliness uh, problems for some subsectors, we are, which are not uh, large, but uh, we also want to improve it. Uh, we want to improve our coverage. We need to include electronic money institutions, which are gaining importance. And also we, we are going to uh, include portfolio management companies uh, as, a, as to the related sector. Um, we want to have a more detailed sectoral coverage from IIP and BOP so we can use it as the only, as the, uh, the data source. And uh, we want to have a more flexible database uh, for now, as it comes from uh, many different sources, our database is not very flexible. So we want to have a database that can serve for um, all kinds of resource purposes also. That's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And like the previous presentation, also really impressed by the work you've been doing. Thank and you. I can imagine that there are some questions from the floor. Just to start off, maybe for me, uh, do you also, so do you have an MOU um, mm. uh, behind the, the collaboration with the statistical mm. office or is that something that? Uh, we have an official program, official it's program. a statistics program mm -hmm. and uh, it um, gives the responsibility, it specifies the responsibility areas for each institution, also yeah. the data sharing uh mm -hmm. responsibilities for each institution it is a medium term program like four or five years uh it is like a legislation so okay. it is the main uh item we are using yeah, for yes 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 but we are working on a uh um a memorandum of yeah. item uh yeah. for i think general government we were discussing it with my colleague from turkstat uh but the main uh is the official statistics program Right, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, could you please uh, tell us uh, how many workers are involved in compiling uh, financial accounts since you produce it on a quarterly basis? And also, what is the time? I mean, uh, how many days after the quarter you uh, publish accounts? Uh, we are now uh, five people, but we are going to be six uh, on the team. But uh, on the development phase, I mean, uh, when we were adding all the sectors and increasing the coverage, the team was large. Um, th the number of the workers were much higher. I mean, we were like eight people, maybe. But for now, we are six people. And we are um, disseminating the data like for the second quarter of this year, it was disseminated in uh, July, and we we are going to disseminate the third quarter uh, in December, like three months, two and a half months. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation, Burku. It's a great presentation. I have a question. Did you change something in monetary statistics when you started to compile the financial accounts? Or you took the monetary statistics in the form in which it was available? You just took net position, net position on changes of assets and liabilities, or you introduced the monetary statistics related to the full uh, turnovers on financial instruments. I'm talking about reviews of central bank and other depository corporations. Uh, so if you, if I catch the question correctly, uh, you are asking, asking if we use uh, money and banking statistics directly uh, and centrally, yes. Um, what we did is we started with the money and banking statistics and also central bank that, that was available for us. Um, we are using money and banking statistics, but we use um, additional surveys uh, for, for example, to calculate 
character evaluations, we need to have the uh, currency breakdown for uh, financial instruments. So we also have some other surveys complementing that data. Is it okay for the answer? Can I answer it? Almost, uh, just one more question. Besides compiling financial accounts, do you also compile the balance of financial assets and liabilities? Do you do a verification part of all the transactions or you haven't started this yet? I mean, we have um, a money and banking statistics separately from financial accounts, it's monthly. Uh, we also have statistics on uh, other financial intermediaries like financial leasing factoring companies. Uh, if I catch the question right, uh, or should I elaborate more? I just uh, went further because in addition to compiling financial accounts to verify all the statistics we compile, we also compile the balance sheet of assets and liabilities. This is further steps. As you already collect the financial accounts, I thought that you may have some developments related to compiling the balance sheets of assets and liabilities. This is just a question. Thank you very much. You almost answered some of my questions. If you have this information, I would appreciate if you can share it. If you don't have information on the balance sheet of assets and liabilities, it's not a problem. I think money and banking statistics that we produce monthly is uh, is the assets of li and liabilities of the, not the financial sector, but the banking sector. We are also disseminating central bank uh, financial statements. Uh, but for the other uh, financial institutions, we do not, we do not have that detailed statistics for banks and central banks yes but for others a less detailed version okay thank you thank you very much hey thank you very much i see no further questions also not from the uh, online participants so again, thank, thank you, you a lot for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, like I said, it really helps us to share experiences mm -hmm. and to learn mm -hmm. from each other. So an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. Um,